Good afternoon and welcome back everybody to another rendition of the BH virtual event space. Very happy to welcome back Joe Edelman. Joe, welcome back. Scott, it's great to be back. Good to see you again. Great to see you again as well. Uh, so Joe was back here about, what was it, about two weeks ago? About two weeks, yep. About two weeks ago, yeah. And we were talking about creative portraiture. And so this is the second part to that. So if you missed the first part, I definitely recommend going back and checking out what he had to say about it. This is all going to follow up on that. But today we're just diving deeper into it, talking more about the art of that uh, creative elements beyond the portrait. So Joe's got a lot to cover. I've got nothing to contribute at this point, but uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to get them into Joe using the Zoom chat, uh, actually the Q&A feature on Zoom, I should say, and live stream in Facebook, you can use the comment side of things. So Joe, the floor is yours. I'll be back later on. I'll see you. All right, Scott. Thank you so much. Folks, thanks for checking uh, things out today and tuning in. So last time, we talked about everything kind of leading up to the shoot, right? We talked about where do the ideas come from? We talked about prep and we kind of took everything at a 30,000 foot level. So today I know that a lot of you want to get into the kind of meat and potatoes of the gear, the fun stuff, right? The lighting, how do we get the really cool color with the gels, all of that. So we're going to start it's shoot day. You're ready to go. You've got your team assembled. You are in your studio and you're ready to create. So if you're just starting out, which I know some of you are, and you're just getting into this, it's really important and it's really helpful. Don't overlook the little things that ultimately can get in the way of a great shoot. So, and I'm talking like really little things. Like one of my first steps, make sure the studio space is at a comfortable temperature for your subject. I always have water, snacks available throughout the day, and I'll encourage my subjects to eat grapes or bananas. That way they keep their energy level up. I also will let them know that they should snack and drink when they come off the set before the makeup artist touches up their makeup. Not as soon as the makeup artist has just finished their lips and their makeup and they're ready to walk on the set. Don't assume that your subjects will automatically know that. But once everybody's settled in, I've got my subject there, I've got my makeup artist, hairstylist there. One of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a few minutes and actually look through the outfits in person. Last time we talked about how I come up with a lot of the ideas for outfits. It may just be material that I'm wrapping. It may be things that I've gotten at a consignment shop or bought you know, inexpensively online, like through Amazon or someplace like that. So once I've got everybody there and the makeup artist is starting their work, I wanna look through the outfits in person and kind of walk through the ideas with the entire team just to see if there's any last minute concerns or ideas that come up. Maybe some of the outfits, the colors may look a little bit different than they did in the pictures that the subject sent to me. So I wanna make sure that I am aware of that so that I can make any last minute adjustments. Then while my subject is in the makeup chair, I'm gonna set up my lighting, do whatever work I had to do on sets if I'm using any sets. The goal being, when my subject walks onto the set for that first shot, first time, that I am ready for the first shot of the day. Now, I get it. That sounds pretty logical and kind of obvious, right? But you'd be amazed how many photographers, especially when they're starting out and they kind of haven't been burned by this, but you'd be amazed how many photographers overlook that step and they don't leave enough time in their schedule to have the first shot completely set up and ready to go. What they do is they wait for the subject to come on the set and then they start playing with lighting and making adjustments and doing test shots. And please don't be the photographer with a pretty subject in front of you who takes a test shot, looks at the back of the camera and mutters, oh crap, because your exposure is not good or whatever. That's not gonna get your shoot off to a really good start, right? And that's why this is a big deal. There's a famous quote from, it's frequently attributed to the boxer, Mike Tyson, confidence breeds success and success breeds confidence. And think about it, that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish with all the shoot prep that we talked about in part one, along with the idea of being completely prepared for your first shot when your subject hits the set. And by the way, completely prepared means not only are you set up, but you've tested your lighting, you've tested your exposure, you're ready to shoot because this way, right out of the box from the very first frame, you're shooting usable, good images. 
So you automatically feel more confident and you feel like your shoot is headed in the right direction. And your subject, even though they may be nervous, they're gonna relax a whole lot faster when they're hearing click, 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 and hopefully seeing some awesome results. And please don't kid yourself and think that your subject wants to hear things like, oh yeah, that's great, oh, awesome, wonderful, awesome. No, not really, because unfortunately that can come across as disingenuous. What your subject really wants to hear when they're in front of the camera is simply click, 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 click. The more you're clicking, the more the simple perception is that things must be going well. So we got to get into lighting. And first, let's talk a little bit about the gear. If you follow me, you know that I'm not a hardcore gear guy. So I'm not going to debate what's the coolest, latest, neatest. I'm going to tell you what I use. And I'm going to tell you some of your options. And then more importantly, I'm going to show you some of the differences between those options. So the first question I get when it comes to lighting for the kind of work that I do, and this really applies to any studio lighting at all today, and that is, what's the best way to go? Speed lights, studio strobes, constant LEDs. The simple answer is yes, all of the above. So if you've already got speed lights, work with speed lights. If you've already got studio strobes, work with studio strobes. If you're already like me and you're working with LEDs, work with LEDs, right? At the end of the day, light is light what's more important and obviously you know you can go out and buy lots of gear b and h can help you with that but what's more important is understanding how to use that light understanding light placement understanding things like the inverse square law because they become tools that allow you to not only finesse the light but also to manipulate it in ways and be more creative to really make your images pop. So for me, more important than the actual light source is the modifier. Because overwhelming majority of the time, I'm going to modify my light, at least my key light. I frequently don't modify my background lights or my rim lights, but my key light, almost always. Honestly, this is gonna disappoint a lot of you, but my favorite, or I should say one of my top two favorite modifiers is simply a shoot through umbrella. Really basic, really simple. 32 inches to 43 inches. It doesn't need to be five feet big or in diameter. It doesn't need to be seven feet in diameter. 32, 43 inches, shoot through. Super simple light, super soft light. And one of the things that you learn about modifiers early in the game, for those of you that may just be starting with lighting, yes, an umbrella is not efficient with the way it modifies light, meaning it's going to throw light pretty much everywhere. Unless you're working in a super tight space where you're worried about things reflecting or light reflecting off the walls, that's not a big deal. And you can have just as much control on your subject, the light hitting your subject with an umbrella, as you can with a soft box or an octa box or a beauty dish. It's all about placement in the inverse square law. But if I do want my light a little bit more controlled and managed, I'm gonna go with a 26 inch folding softbox. I, this is the one that I actually use. It's from Photix, it's the Photix Raja 65. Uh, I love this box. It's just big enough to give me really, really nice portrait light, but it's not so big that it's taking up my whole studio when I shoot. Now, certainly if I was doing a full length fashion shoot or something like that, I might want a bigger modifier to be able to light a person head to toe. But remember the shots that we're talking about today, creative portraits, we're generally working kind of from bust up. So I don't need spread that's going to cover the whole body. So honestly, for me, when I am setting up my lighting and determining modifiers and placement and all that, and we're still talking about just the key light, my number one goal for that light is simply make it flattering, right? There, there's a beauty element to these creative portraits that I do. And it's important to me that I'm gonna keep that light as flattering as possible to make my subject look good. Even when the shot is one where there's so much makeup or so many props that the picture's not really about that person, I still want to flatter that person. So whenever possible, I like to keep uh, to kiss it. Keep it 
super simple. So I'm going to show you a series of diagrams first, and then I'm going to show you actually some sample images after I go through them. The reason why I'm going to go through them quickly with just the diagrams, I want you to see the subtle differences in the light. In fact, um, I apologize. I can't take myself. Yes, I can. I can. Let me take myself off the screen for a second so that you guys can see it as big as possible. So I mentioned that I like to use umbrellas. So what you've got here is a shot. That circle that you're seeing on the floor, basically that is a 10-foot diameter circle. I'm not suggesting you have to go and post a, a, you know, a 10-foot circle on your floor, but so that you have a sense of placement and distance, etc. So I've got that umbrella at uh, about five feet from the subject, the stand, okay? And you can see the result in the upper right-hand corner of the frame. I mentioned I also like to work with the Octobox. So you'll notice I'm going to switch back to umbrella. Look at the finished image of the 3D model. There it is with the umbrella because we have a little bit more throw of the light, just one light. Things on camera left are a little bit softer. We go to the soft box, things become a little bit more focused. We get a little bit more depth in the face. Light placement is still the same. It has not changed. Also, sometimes I will use a beauty dish. I used to use a beauty dish a lot more. I've gotten to the point in the last couple of years where I've realized I kind of don't need the beauty dish that much. I can accomplish what I want with the Octobox or for that matter, with the umbrella. I just have to pay a little bit more attention. Um, every now and then, and you'll see some images, I do uh, clamshell lighting where I've got one light up, one light down. Of course, when you do this, you're going to get two catch lights in the eye, one above the other. And then you can take that and you can rotate them basically, do a rotated clamshell where you've got one light on either side, gives you nice soft light with very even fall off. And of course, then you are going to have two catch lights in the eyes, right? Now, which is better? How do you know which one? What's best? Those are all questions that honestly you should never ask. The reason being, the real answer, it's up to you. There's no rule book for that. So part of the moral to the story is if you only have an umbrella right now and you're trying to learn lighting, eventually you are going to want soft boxes or an octobox or maybe a beauty dish. But trust me, start out simple and keep working with that umbrella. Maybe add a reflector and you'll be amazed at what you can do. And then from there, start adding to your arsenal of modifiers. But literally the best modifier is one, just like with cameras, it's what you have. And two, it's what you're comfortable with, what gives you the feel for the shot that you like. But what I want to show for you folks here is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch into uh, a little piece of software. So I've got the software live now. For those of you that have never seen this software before, it comes from Germany, uh, a company called Elixir. It, the software name is Set A Light 3D with periods in between all the words. So Set Period A Period Light 3D. Um, this is an awesome piece of software that allows you to basically plan and work your lighting. It's incredibly accurate. I can set exposure and lighting in this software, and then I could walk into my studio, use the same settings, and I'm going to have proper exposure based on this. I only bring that up so that you understand that the results that you see in the software are incredibly accurate to what will happen once you're working with a real light. So a few things that I want to point out to you before we kind of get fancy with this light, okay? First of all, what I've created here is uh, similar to what you were seeing in the diagram before. I've got a 10-foot diameter circle. And the only reason I do this, especially for those of you that are newer to lighting, that are maybe just getting started out, uh, I hate the word rule, but I tend to call this the 10-foot rule for lighting. And understand it's not something that you have to do, but it's an easy way to solve a big problem that new photographers routinely have. If you've been experimenting with lighting and doing portraits for a little while, you have probably already experienced the situation where you set your lights up, you start your shot, you get a couple shots and you realize, ah, you know what, I wanna move the light over a little bit because I don't like the shadow. 
you move the light over, you do a quick shot. It's like, okay, maybe you move it more. Then you're going to move it again. And then you get move it again. And you finish that shot and you move on. A little bit later, you download your images into your computer and you realize, oh my gosh, after I moved the light the first time, I never checked my exposure again. And so what you wind up with is here you're trying to shoot this portrait, but your exposure in your files is all over the place. In part, if you're using strobes, because you only see the images if you chimp, if you check them and preview them after the fact, right? If you're shooting mirrorless with LEDs, which is part of the reason why I like working with LEDs, what you see in the viewfinder is exactly what your finished image is. So this is where the 10 foot rule comes in. Imagine a 10 foot circle and you could literally take a piece of string. Yeah, string, tie it to the light stand and measure five feet. So once you set your light down and you test it at five feet, let's say you decide, you know what? I want to soften up the light on the camera left side of my subject's face. If you stay at that five foot distance and move your light over, you can do that and your exposure doesn't change. Whoops. Let's say that you want it more dramatic. You can stay at the five foot distance and your exposure doesn't change. Just the light quality changes. Okay. So it's a way to make sure if you're new to lighting and you're new to shooting portraits and working with models and all that, and if you're finding that you struggle after that first shot, because remember, we're going to set up that first shot. We're going to have it perfect and ready to go before the subject gets on set. But then when you start making changes, a lot of photographers, they, they kind of get out of sorts and then they wind up with exposures that are all over the place. If you're working with the five foot rule, you've basically got a string tie your light stand and i promise you right maybe another photographer is going to say you got to use a string your subject's not going to care all they care about is that the images turn out great so when you're ready to move that stand hand them the end of the string and say hold it here and then just move the stand boom and your exposure is going to be exactly the same so all you're really worried about at that point is light placement in terms of how it's impacting your shadows the depth on your subject's face all that other things that are important to look at, just in case we have some people here that maybe are a little bit new to shooting portraits and shooting people, I want you to notice that I have the light placed so that easily two thirds of that modifier are above my subject's eyes. Uh, it would be the same if I'm using, let me, um, let me switch over here to a, a softbox, okay? If I'm using my 26 inch softbox, you'll notice I've got two thirds of the light above my subject's eyes. And that's because I want to make sure, number one, that the catch lights are in the top half of the eyes. Not because it's a rule. Remember, I don't like rules. I want them to be in the top half of the eye because that's where our brains expect the catch light to be. By the time we're like two years old, our brains are hardwired to expect light to come from above. That's why when you walk into a room, the light's not in the floor, it's in the ceiling, right? So, I want the majority of the light from above my subject. Beginner rookie mistake with lighting modifiers is to kind of set the modifier at about halfway um, so that the, the person subject's face is like right in the middle. Let me just move it over so it's not blocking the camera. Now, the problem that you have is if you look at the top of her nose right here, how we're starting to get these shadows, even for that matter, uh, a little bit on the top edge of the lip, the lower that light comes, the more those shadows get dramatic. It's like zombie lighting. That's why in the movies, when they're showing zombies, they put the light below, not above. It's important, keep the light above. And then what happens is those unflattering shadows, like along the side of the nose and that, you are softening those shadows. And you're just creating nice depth and nice shape, plus, you're getting catch lights that are in the top of your subject's eyes, right? So people will often ask me, well, what's more important, Joe? Do you want, you know, your lights at like 45 degrees, 25 degrees? And my honest answer is, I have no clue. I don't pay attention to degrees. What I do pay attention to is, where are my catch lights? And I pay attention to the idea of, is the light flattering? Simple solution is the closer the light comes to the axis of your camera and camera lens, the flatter and the softer the light's going to be. The more that you bring it out to the side, the more depth 
and more shadowing that you're going to get. So one of the things that you do need to teach yourself to pay attention to, and, and again, this applies to regular portraits and it applies to fashion portraits. So it's really kind of more of a portrait lighting lesson. You have to pay attention, especially if you start bringing your lights out to the side, as long as my subject is looking towards camera right, like she is now, everything's happy, everybody's fine. But if she turns her face towards camera left, or if I tell her to turn her face towards camera left, now I'm gonna pick up a lot more shadowing on this side of her face, which is not what we want to happen. But just to give you also, again, a, a little bit more sense um, with the lighting arrangements that I was talking about before, I want to show you some examples with, with the, each of the different types that I use. So going back to the umbrella light, okay? This is a shot done with a 32 inch white shoot through umbrella and a Godox 8200 flash, okay? Uh, similarly, a white shoot through umbrella. In fact, this one was done, I have to cry a little bit. This was done two years ago this week in New York City at Photo Plus. Uh, so this was done on the Olympus stage shot with a white shoot through umbrella and a Godox 8200 strobe. Similarly, Godox 8200, and you can even see the umbrella because I had the model look directly at it and use the reflection in the glasses. Switching to my Octabox or round beauty dish, you're gonna get lighting and catch lights that look like this and this and this. Switching to the beauty dish, this is a shot done with just one light, okay? Just one, no reflectors, no additional rim lights, background lights, hair lights, nothing, one light. Similarly, one way that you can tell if a key light in a shot, if you're looking at somebody else's pictures, and you're trying to figure out how they do it, and you think maybe it's a beauty dish, but you're not sure, blow the image up really, really big and look at the very center of the catch light. With a beauty dish, you will generally get a little gray spot in the center of the catch light. And that is from the deflector plate that is inside the beauty dish. That's what causes the gray spot. So also lit with the beauty dish, okay? I talked about the clamshell lighting before, another one of my favorites. I haven't done a lot of clamshell work in the last couple of years, but again, for me, I, I kind of cycle through these as the mood hits me. In my mind, I see this clamshell lighting as kind of a very commercial type lighting. Because of the, the evenness but crispness that it gives to the lighting, the lighting tends to feel a lot like what you would see, from, from my mind, a lot like what you might see in an advertisement in a magazine. So I look at it as kind of a very commercial lighting. I don't consider it to be particularly moody. I don't consider it to be particularly soft. I just see it as very crisp and very flattering. Okay, uh, and again, you notice you have two catch lights, one on the top, one on the bottom. A rookie mistake to be careful of, I'm just gonna go back here, when you're doing this type of clamshell lighting, it is very common that the soft box you're using or whatever modifier you're using on the bottom is actually going to wind up a little closer to the subject's face than your top box, in part because the top box, you need to get it high enough to be able to shoot underneath it right? So it's got to be out of your way. And depending on the height of your stool or whatever your subject is sitting on, they may be no, low enough to the ground that you can't move the bottom box away any further. So beginner mistake is working with the logic that, oh, set both lights at exactly the same power. That is not how you're going to get ideal lighting with the clamshell light. The top light, you always want it to be just a little bit more powerful because your goal is, even though you're creating this very even, crisp light, you still want to have some shading on the bottom of the jaws, bottom of the nose. That gives you a little bit of depth. You don't want the person to look just you know, completely flat and kind of totally two-dimensional in that sense. So uh, that's not a scenario where you're going to have the light matched exactly in terms of power. However, if we turn that sideways and we do the rotated clamshell like you see here, this is a case where you want both sides to be exactly the same power because what you're trying to do is you're trying to even that light out, right? That's, that's what you're working towards here. So to give you some examples, 
working with the two lights. But again, as you see, you get two, whoops, sorry, wrong direction there. You get two vertical catch lights when you do that. I don't have a problem with vertical catch lights. Uh, you will see people online that will respond where it's like, no, two catch lights, it just looks weird. It's just distracting. Uh, I mean, we all know that a very popular thing in the headshot world is using the triangle lighting where you've got the triangle catch lights. I can tell you that in all my years of photographing people and especially doing portraiture and beauty portraiture and all that stuff, I've never had a subject look at a photograph and ask or point out or comment about the catch lights ever. The only people that have ever commented or pointed out or had something to say about catch lights, they're all people like you folks watching that have cameras. So it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to catch lights. My rule, if you will, or my guideline for catch lights is I don't want it to be distracting to me. I don't want it to take away from the subject. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody else won't look at this picture and say, well, those vertical catch lights are really distracting. That may be the case. But in this particular scenario, doesn't bother me at all. I am very happy with them. And at the end of the day, so was my subject. So that's what counts. Okay. And again, another one with the two, um, two vertical boxes side by side. You want the lighting to be even. By the way, just for some fun, uh, the background in that image is hairspray. Yes, she's got a lot of hairspray in her hair, but then I had the makeup artist stand behind her, aim the light with a blue gel back into her hair towards the camera and just start spraying the hairspray. And so what you're seeing is the blue background and the reason why it's speckled is it's actually the hairspray being lit up by the flash with the blue gel and creating that kind of texture. So that's all in camera as is. And that brings us to, honestly, uh, one of the most fun parts of doing these kind of images for me, and that is gels. For my images, gels are super important for a couple of reasons. One, I love bright color. If you've been watching closely with my images, you'll notice, I often joke, I don't think I ever graduated kindergarten when it comes to color because I like bright, bold, primary colors. The more color, the more intensity, the better for me. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways that you're going to get that color. You're going to get it with the things that you put in front of the camera. Like in this case, it's red cellophane. It's actually red Christmas package wrapping that's draped around her neck. It's a red cosplay wig on her head and red plastic glasses, right? Um, you're going to get that color by using gels. Here's an example where you can see on camera left behind the subject, I've got a purple gel or magenta gel. And on camera right behind the subject, I've got a blue gel. And then I've also got a magenta gel aimed at a black background, which is creating that glow. And I'm going to show you how I kind of work my gels and make my gel choices in a moment. So color for me, bright color, bold color, it's important for a lot of reasons, but the, the reason why you should care most about color and one of the things that I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to do a little bit of reading on. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds with it today because literally we could spend hours, but do some reading about how color impacts emotion and mood. It's real science. It's not mumbo jumbo stuff. It's science. It's been around for a long, long, long time. And the simple fact of the matter is as photographers, think about it. When we, when we share our pictures with the world, whether we're sharing it with a friend or a relative or whether we're posting it on Instagram or wherever it's going, once we show that picture to someone else, we don't really get to tell them what their experience should be. No other human being is going to have the same experience with your photos as you did, because in part, you were there, you created it, you got to interact with the subject, you had the fun of doing all this creative stuff. This other person, they're just looking at the finished result. So we actually don't have a lot of control. However, if you take the time to learn about two subjects, one, color, and how it impacts emotion and mood. And then the other one is actually body language. 
one of the things that I purposely haven't talked about because I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that maybe I can get B&H to let me come back and talk about this at a later date because it's something that I feel very strongly about. In the photography industry, we talk way too much about posing. Pose, it's a four-letter word. It's a four-letter word that connotates don't move, which makes people stiff, which creates really bad body language. Every photographer I've ever met, myself included, starts out saying, you know, I'm just, I'm not good at posing. I don't know what to tell people. I don't know what's going to look best. And then at some point they find a resource that's going to show them 50 different poses and they learn 10 or 20 of those 50 different poses. And they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. But what they wind up with is really stiff looking people in interesting poses. Sorry, just keeping it real. What's more important is to learn about body language and learn about how to interact with your subjects and learn about how to create natural postures and natural body language that's gonna look really interesting, look really dynamic, be fun, be serious, dramatic, whatever you're after. But it's a completely different approach. And I feel it's honestly a much more successful approach, not just for portraits like you're seeing here, but for full length images, you name it. So you've got these two controls, right? You've got color and you've got body language that are going to allow you to influence what people are seeing and what people are experiencing. So let's go ahead. I'm going to switch my screen over again before we get to post-production and let's look a little bit kind of gels 101, if you will, and how you can, if you're not already working with gels, how you can start working with gels really, really easy. And then from there, part of what I'm going to show you is exactly how I do it. And it's probably going to frustrate some of you because it's not a simple step one, step two, step three. It's really all about failing. So in this diagram that we have here, you can see uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move my light, my key light over just a smidge more so that I have a little bit more drama with the shadow on the camera left side of her face, right? And we're gonna keep that gray background. The background that you're looking at here for this shot would be the equivalent of like a thunder gray background from Savage. So it's, it's like a middle to slightly dark gray. It's not the really, really dark gray and it's definitely not like the lighter grays. Absolutely my favorite color. If I could only own one background for all of my photography, this would be it. It would be a thunder gray background. The reason being, I can make this background black. I can make this background white. And I can really, really easily make this background any color that I want it to be just by adding gels. Making it black is simply by moving it further away from the subject. Making it white is by adding light to it and overexposing it. And then color, of course, is with the gels. So when we start to talk about the idea of gels and where do we put the gels and how do we work the gels? Whoops, that's the background light. Let's go to the rim light here. I'm gonna back out a little bit and you can see I've got a light over here on camera left. I'm gonna use the circle again just so that I have an easy reference in terms of where things, um, where things are and placement. I've got the light, whoops, sorry. I've got the light aimed right towards my subject's head. And for my taste, meaning there's no right or wrong, for my taste right now, the light is actually just a tiny bit too bright. It's important for me when I add rim lights, and it, this doesn't matter if it has a gel on it with color or even if it were just a white light, I still like to be able to see the detail in the edge that I'm lighting. Are there times where it's kind of cool if you blow it out and that's really hot? Sure, there are times. But for me, those are very rare and kind of far and few between. I almost always want to be able to see detail. And even now with what you're seeing up above me, that's about as bright as I would want to go with it. I still think there's even value, depending on the purpose of the portrait, to tune it down just a little bit more. Now, the key to what I've done here, I'm gonna turn it off again for a second, with my lighting. So working with two lights, we've got a key light and we've got a ring light. Basically with a key light, I have intentionally created a shadow, right? Most photographers, when they look at the image that you see above me now, would look at this side of the subject's face and say, 
you know, the hair is just really dark and it's kind of like a void and it's kind of boring. Yes, there's separation from the background, but it's just, it's really not that interesting on that side of the subject. So I'm creating a shadow with my key light and then I am filling in the shadow with my gelled light. Two lights just to give it a little bit of oomph. Now, how do I know what colors to pick? So part of that little bit of research that you're going to do on color and emotion, it's going to take you to a phrase called color palettes. If you're not good at intuitively saying, well, you know what? Blue and orange are going to look cool together. That's okay. Don't walk around with the attitude or the idea like, yeah, you know, I'm just not really good at mixing colors. And it's one of those things. For some people, it comes very intuitively. For other people, it's a little bit more of a science and they need some help. For me, I'm kind of a weird combination. I'm lucky the color mixing comes intuitively. The whole learning and the technical aspect of mixing colors, I really struggle with. It's actually just kind of overwhelming to me. Either way, it doesn't matter. If you find that you need help with it, there are tons of resources online where you can find color palettes. In fact, you can even download apps for iPhone and Android that will give you tons and tons and tons of color palettes where you can simply go ahead and start with a color. Maybe it's the colored blouse that your subject is wearing. Maybe it's if you're doing a fashion portrait, it's the crazy material that you're wrapping around. You start with that color as your base, and then it's going to recommend for you other colors that are going to play well. And if you look hard enough, you'll find that a lot of these resources will recommend color palettes for you based on the mood that you're trying to create, right? So it's not really an acceptable excuse. If you want to use color, you want to do this stuff, don't let it hold you back if it doesn't come naturally. There's tons of resource information out there. And with apps, you can carry it in your phone so it's available and you're good to go. Because again, nobody's going to care that you don't know the right colors. They only care about the finished image. It doesn't matter how you got there, right? It just matters that you get there. That's the key. So the simple beginning for gels, create a shadow, fill a shadow. Doesn't get any easier for that, right? Obviously, you know, let's go ahead and turn that, that key light off again. You know, we could play around with gels and we could start doing, you know, crazy colors and all that. We're going to skip on that today. But I mean, don't think that's not an option, right? Obviously, we would need to change our exposure here. You know, we want to bring it brighter, but sky's the limit. I'm going to work with the idea today that I still want to keep uh, at least, um, you know, the, the majority of my subject's face. I want kind of uh, a normal skin tone, proper white balance, okay? So we're gonna add the colors in from there. So another thing that you can do with adding colors, just to jazz up an image. So we're gonna kind of build here a little bit. If you don't want to do the rim light, you can go ahead and you can add a background color. Now you notice already, this is what I was talking about before. I've got a light, and by the way, these lights, even though they don't look like it, I have them set up as 200 watt seconds, which would be equivalent to a Godox AD200 um, from a power standpoint. Okay, just to give you know all of you a reference. One of the big questions I get about strobe lighting in particular in a studio. Do I need 400 watt seconds? Do I need 600 watt seconds? Do I need more than that? I'm sorry, no you don't, okay? You really don't. Most photographers that are shooting people really don't need more than 200 watt seconds for their lighting. Now, yes, if you're one of those photographers that wants to be outside and overpower the sun at noon without having to think about it, then yeah, you're going to need, you know, a 600 watt second strobe. But if you're doing predominantly studio work, portraiture, this type of stuff, even for full length shots, 200 watt seconds is, is really quite ample. Okay. So um, for the background light, I can put a light back there with the gel. And again, by adjusting the power, I can create a real subtle separation. In fact, let me bring my, my key light powers a little hot there. There we go. Or I can go ahead and I can start to turn that background into an intense bright blue. Now, part of the reason why I also want to show you this and going back to my five foot or excuse me, 10 foot diameter circle, my five foot rule. Okay. 
if you look at the placement here, I've got a seven inch reflector on this light that's back here. So with a seven inch reflector, and I'm shooting with the equivalent of a 90 millimeter lens. I have this lighting diagram set up since I'm an Olympus shooter. I shoot with micro four thirds. Yeah, in a studio. All those images you saw that I did are shot with micro four thirds. Uh, I've got this set up with a 45 millimeter, which for you full frame shooters, that's a 90 millimeter, 90 millimeter equivalent. When I was a full frame shooter before I made the switch, my go-to lens for all this type of work was a 100 millimeter f 2.8 macro lens from Tokina. I was a Nikon guy before I went to Olympus and the 100 millimeter uh, f 2.8 Tokina, gorgeous lens and really, really inexpensive. So from a focal length standpoint, that's basically where I'm working the shots, 90 to 100 millimeter, but with a little less than five foot distance and a seven inch reflector, I am able to still fill the whole background and make the whole background bright blue okay and by the way i mentioned before like being able to make it white if i take that gel off and we bring the power up a little bit more same thing notice i've got a completely white background right so that's that's the beauty of the gray background is being able to really manipulate colors and and all that good stuff here now let me get this back to there we go. We'll do it that way. Okay. So now I've got the blue in there. All right. So where the real fun comes in with gels, right? So we've done the rim light where we had the orange rim light. We've done uh, the blue background. We could certainly, we could make it orange as well, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick with blue right now since she's got the blue top and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to spend some of your money and I'm going to add a third light. Okay. Um, but I'll show you a cool little trick that you can get away with with this third light that actually makes it look like you have more than three lights at play, okay? So now you're starting to see more of the feel of what you see in a lot of my images where you've got all of these different colors mixing in. I've got orange coming in on camera left. And by the way, part of the reason for picking orange in a shot like this is one, it interacts well and looks cool against the blue um that the subject is wearing and the blue background also too since she has light brown hair or like a medium brown hair that orange really lights up the hair and makes it look really cool so that's another reason for using that okay but this is where you want to experiment and i, I can't stress enough how important it is to experiment so we can take whoop, let me back out again here we can take these two lights that i've got set up with the color i'm going to move this over and oh one other thing i should show you I got ahead of myself, my apologies. When you're setting rim lights, like you see here, rookie mistake to pay attention to, your subject's nose. If you move the light too far forward, you get to a point where you start to light up their nose. Not very flattering, right? It's not unless you wanna make like a Christmas thing and make them look like Rudolph, right? So you wanna make sure that you are bringing that light no further than where it's going to hit. And part of what you have to decide here now, even where it's at, you'll notice I'm starting to hit her cheek. You may like that. You may not like that. You notice I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying be aware we're starting to hit her cheek right here. Okay. For the sake of this setup, you know, I would wind up bringing it right back there and just focus on the hair. If this shadow was bothering me, very simply, I would go ahead and... Oops, let's unlock that. Getting trigger happy with the power there. There we go. So let's bring that back to 5.9. I would go ahead and move that light over, which it is not letting me do here. Let's apply that and see if it's going to... There's why it's not letting. Okay, sorry. So if that shadow is bothering me, I can soften that shadow by moving the light over. But here's a cool trick. We've got just this one light working here. If I bring this light all the way out to the side of this room, okay, which by the way, each square on the floor represents 12 inches, right? So this is not a particularly huge shooting space, okay? Um, but by bringing the light 
all the way out and then turning it so that I'm kind of splitting the difference. Now you notice what I have here. I've got orange light filling onto the background. I've got orange light on her hair. It is not on her face. I am going to turn the power up. I still don't want to lose the detail, right? So we're going to go right about there. But now if I bring that blue light back in and I start to turn the power down on the blue light, I can start to get really interesting combinations of light. In fact, I could bring this light out to the side and I can start to get a gradient as the light goes back and forth and mixes. And believe me, this is something that, you know, we could play with this literally for hours in terms of how we can combine these colors and what we can come up with. So the, the key to the color gels, honestly, is just do it, right? It doesn't matter what kind of gels you use. If you're working with speed lights or working with the smaller Godox flashes, I personally, I love the MagMod stuff. You could use, you know, the Roscoe sheet gels. Look, if you're really on a budget and that's what's holding you back from using gels, go to a dollar store and get cellophane. It, you're going to need to kind of double and triple the layers, but it will allow you to start experimenting and then save your pennies and get the good stuff. If you purchase good gels, they're going to last you, right? That's the key. But when you're dealing with these colors, people will often ask, well, do I need to buy like really, really high end gels because they're going to give me better blue or better orange? Certainly there may be some technical aspects in terms of the purity of those colors at different color temperatures. Absolutely. But we're talking about very subjective creativity here. So it's not something that you have to be super, super, super picky about, right? So just by starting to add in color like you're seeing, you can start to really kind of, you know, give your images a very creative feel. And then, of course, this is all before we start adding in all kinds of cool props and, and, and interesting pieces, right? So sky's the limit on this. That's the thing. Kind of like I mentioned with posing, looking for somebody to say, well, you can do this setup or this setup or this setup or this setup or this setup. All that's really doing is it's putting you in a box where you're kind of copying what someone else has done. This is one of those areas as a photographer, if you're going to do creative images that you really have the opportunity to think outside the box and come up with things that you've never imagined before. But you have to actually experiment with it and play with it. Okay. All right. So where am I at? I'm getting close on time here. So I want to make sure that I get into a couple of other things. Uh, one is post-production. So obviously now that I have 12 minutes to go, I do not have the time to teach you how to retouch images. And that was not, that was not part of the plan. Um, I will tell you that if you are going to do photo retouching on your images, which I highly recommend for this type of imagery, um, here we go. I'm going to spend some of your time, not your money, but your time. You need to put in the time and you need to put in the practice. And that's really the key. It's learning your way through Photoshop um, and, and really, really practicing with it. There is a lot of awesome technology coming out in terms of AI technology. You have programs like you know, Luminar is doing a lot of really, really cool stuff with AI. Adobe, obviously, in their latest release that just came out is including tons of really, really high-powered AI tools. Um, you even have the software programs like Portrait Pro, which, word of warning, really powerful, kind of cool, but also really, really easy to make your subject look completely alien and not like themselves. So use it judiciously, right? But um, bottom line, at the end of the day, there's no one simple, like one-click retouching software out there. And here's why. The software is not capable for all that it's capable of doing. And it's amazing. It is not capable of knowing how you look at things and how you see things. So even if you're going to work with a retoucher and there's no shame in working with a retoucher, you're going to find that that retoucher will give you better work if you're able to communicate to them in detail what you like, what you don't like, and how you want it done. So what's the net? The net is the more that you understand about doing the retouching yourself, the better. Find a YouTube resource. 
for retouching. Notice I said a YouTube resource. There's tons out there. But here's the thing. If you've played with Photoshop for even 10 minutes or Luminar or any of them, you know that there's at least 10 ways to do everything. And they all work, right? So if you start pulling all of your learning resources from different resources, the problem that you run into, if you're not already well-versed in the program, you're going to get spun in circles because one person will do it one way, another person will do it another way. Find someone whose videos you understand and you like, follow them, use them as a resource, and only go somewhere else after you have really gotten to the point where you feel super confident with what you're doing or if they don't have the answer. I will say that probably one of my favorite resources for Photoshop work is my friend, Unmish Dinda. He's from India. He runs the channel Picks Imperfect. I highly, highly, highly recommend him for Photoshop work. But one of the things that I wanted to point out to you is just something that I've been playing with a lot lately myself. Uh, I still feel I have a long way to go. So I'm, I'm showing you images that ultimately I probably wouldn't put in my portfolio, but I'm having some fun with it. And I think there's a lot of potential. I've been doing photography for a lot of years and I'm always looking for new ways, new things that are going to challenge me and take me outside the box. So one of the things that I've been playing with is what I refer to as digital makeup. And probably the best example that I could start with is a picture like this, but it actually started like this. Now, let me say this right up front. This is not one of those things like Oh, you know what? This doesn't really look that good in color. So if I click the black and white button, oh, it looks really cool. Now I'm excited about the picture. Certainly, you might be able to do that from time to time. And you might save an otherwise mundane or boring picture. But I'm a firm believer when it comes to this stuff, just like with black and white. Make that decision when you have the camera in your hands. Because that way, all the lighting choices, all the composition choices, all the exposure choices, everything you do will be geared towards the finished product, meaning you're ultimately going to be able to get a better quality image out of it, right? So this particular shot was done with the goal being to do this digital makeup. What I did then is I literally went to a stock photography website and I found this textured pattern, okay? And then simply laying it over and working with blend modes just blend modes, I was able to get the texture added to the face, still be able to see the skin texture. And then two last steps, a mask to paint out the eyes and the hair. Super easy though, gang. And a little bit of dodging and burning to bring depth back to the nose underneath the lips and the side of the face. So again, a little bit of experimenting, a little bit of practice. You can do some really cool stuff. Um, similarly, shot like this with a texture overlay, just like I just showed you. Uh, here's another one that I started out with. Uh, I went with kind of very neutral tones. I'm on a brown background. Uh, I've got, you know, a darker skin model with really dark hair. This was actually at the end of another shot that I did. And I thought, you know what? I want to play with this digital makeup. So let me do this, this shot this way. The finished shot that I came up with is this that you see here. This was one of my earliest attempts. A lot of room for improvement. I'm going to tell you that right up front, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. And this is literally just done. And here's the, the layers panel from Photoshop for that image. Basically, each of the different colors that you see that I added to that shot is on a different layer. And I've masked just that section of the face, set the blend modes um, to anywhere from, you know, either um, it, it might be like a, a, a linear linear dodge or a linear burn, or it might be darker, it might be lighter. Experiment with the blend modes, set the blend modes, and then painted the colors in to get a finished result like that. The bottom line to all of this stuff, gang, is have fun. Simply have fun. Don't worry about some set of rules that you heard or what you're supposed to be doing, especially like we talked about lighting today. You know. The way I approach lighting is I look for the perfect imperfect. There is no perfect, right? Lighting doesn't need to be perfect and it doesn't need to be super precise because really what I'm after, I'm after the mood. I'm after the way that it's going to make me feel and make my subject feel and make people feel when they look at the, the image. But in order to do these creative portraits, 
aside from having fun, and I put that first on the list because that is, if, if you're not having fun, then why do it, right? Why do we do this if we're not having fun? But the other thing, if you really want to get good at it, and if you want to master it or even just progress, you've got to be willing to fail. Failure is good. Now, certainly we don't want to fail when everything's on the line, right? We don't want to fail when it's important and we have to deliver something, but that's also why we practice. That's why we experiment. And part of that practice and that experimentation is failure. Because again, if you go out and you find a book that says you can do a creative portrait this way, or you find a tutorial that says, yes, add this color and place it at 45 degrees and do this, all of that's great. But all you're going to do is create a bad copy of something that somebody else has done. In order to make it your own, in order to really learn what works, you've got to experiment and you've got to fail. And don't be afraid to fail. Cause I will tell you, especially for me at this point in my career, I suffer from been there, done that. I've been shooting for so long. So many ideas pop into my head. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I know what I'll get there. Uh, no, I know what I'll get there. It's like, I've done that before. I don't want to do it again. That's boring. So how do I find new ideas? I joked last time, it's drugs. It's not drugs. I find those new ideas by being willing to fail, by trying stuff, having it go completely south, and then looking at that and saying, ah, oh, but you know what? If I made this change or I made that change, I could do something really cool here. So I hope you find that helpful. I hope that honestly inspires you to get out there and play around a little bit experiment, see what you can do. Hopefully you also realize you don't have to spend tons of money on clothing and props and all that kind of stuff. You can do it cheap and have fun. Great. Well, Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure. Like you said before, uh, you know, I definitely agree. B and H has to have you back. We've got to, we, we've got to have our people. I would love to your people, you know, <laughs> we right, gotta, right. we gotta set that up. It's been absolutely great. You know, these past two times and, you know, hopefully next time, maybe we can jump into some of that post-processing too, get into sure. some of that stuff. Uh, but I want to thank you for being here again, uh, for everybody at home. Uh, you know, that's, that's it for the week for us. That's all we've got scheduled for you. But the good news is, is if you missed anything, you can catch us on the replays. You can go to livestream.com slash BH event space and watch anything you might've missed this past week, or even check out us, our Facebook, uh, BH event space, follow us on Instagram, BH event space, see what's coming up next week, what you might've missed. Um, and that's it. We'll be back next week and we can't wait to see you. So, uh, that's it, Joe. Thanks again, everybody at home. My pleasure. This has Scott. been another rendition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next week.